through the way these ransomware as a service ecosystems work, the ransom demand, once the victim pays it, is shared amongst that, that group, right? It's shared amongst the, the main ransomware group who developed the code, their affiliates are the ones that are actually victimizing organizations. The other you know, the access brokers, the cash out people, things like that, they share all these proceeds amongst these organizations. You know, this is conjecture, but it would not surprise me in the least if another uh, benefactor of that activity is the Russian government themselves. I, it just seems to make all the sense in the world if, if the activity is, is, again, they turn a blind eye to it. Um, if they could also see some financial profit or financial incentive from doing it, privilege of having the 2021 CISO of the year with me, Paul Kayatso. Did I get that right? Pretty darn close. <laughs> yeah. Very good. <laughs> it was close. I did the best I could. Uh, I did the uh, absolute best I could. So uh, Paul, to be the, the 2021 CISO of the year, first of all, congratulations, sir. Congratulations to you. Thank you. So, but how did uh, how did you start? How did this come about? How did you go from where you started to CISO of the year? I'm pretty sure a lot of people have questions like, hey, I'm curious how that path went. So could you sure. give us a rundown of that? Yeah, yeah. happy to. And, you know, first off, just I want to say thanks for having me on the podcast. So um, looking forward to the conversation. Um, you know, CISO of the year, I was honestly, I was shocked by that when it when it came out. I didn't even know that I was nominated or in the running, nor would I expect to have won it given, you know, so many CISOs that I know that would probably be equally deserving, if not more so. Um, but it was certainly an honor and I very much appreciate uh, the recognition on that. Um, I probably have a little bit of a different route to CISO than a lot of my peers um, that I know who sort of have come up through kind of the technical routes of being, you know, systems engineer, et cetera, um, security engineer, moving into more of a management role and then taking the, the role of a chief information security officer. For me, it was a little bit different. Um, I have about 25 years of experience in cyber. And a lot of my initial experience was kind of even before cybersecurity was a discipline unto itself. Um, it was, you know, late 90s, um, relatively new discipline. People were concerned about security, but in a really, you know, sort of um, remedial way or, um, you know, uh, not quite anywhere near as mature as we are now. Um, but I used to do all sorts of stuff, uh, you know, fresh out of high school that maybe I probably shouldn't have done, war driving, et cetera, things like that, playing around, uh, just testing stuff because I like, you know, getting my hands dirty. Um, I ended up taking a, you know, a lot of different technology oriented jobs, doing things like database administration or website design, um, all the way down to help desk and system engineer jobs as well. So a lot of technical work. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to be given an opportunity to work for a very large uh, defense contractor uh, supporting uh, Marine Corps and the Navy uh, on some pretty important projects. And my responsibility was uh, securing the networks of, um, you know, basically the Navy's Bureau of Medicine and Surgery, which is, uh, if you're familiar with Walter Reed Hospital, where like the president and vice president get their medical care, that's it. So responsible for securing that environment was a pretty um, interesting challenge. Um, and it was something that I, you know, I didn't really have schooling. There wasn't really security specific schooling at that time. Of course, you could get certs and things like that. Um, but that was fun. I enjoyed it. Um, a couple of years into that, I got the opportunity to move into a different uh, federal project that was uh, in the what's called foreign military sales. 
So whenever our military sells either goods or services to allied militaries around the world, it goes through a foreign military sales process. And in this case, we were supporting um, a North African government that was having some real significant terrorism challenges. And this was shortly after 2001, uh, so not far after 9-11. And the country in need uh, needed someone to help them build out effectively a national 911 call system. They didn't have any sort of emergency response or anything like that. So we had to build, you know, literally from the ground up uh, that entire network, you know, the microwave towers, the data centers. I think we, we stood up something like 600 plus data centers across the country. Um, and my responsibility there as enterprise engineer, but primarily focused on security. I'll tell you what, I don't feel like I was qualified for that job at the time. There was a lot of uh, learning on the job, um, but it really pr uh, press pressured me to you know, develop some skills that uh, I certainly, you know, I'm thankful for that opportunity because it really did shape uh, a lot of what you know, came later in my career. Um, but after that, you know, uh, I decided that it might make more sense to expand beyond federal government, beyond military, um, and went to uh, you know, effectively doing similar stuff, but financial industry oriented and still in the DC area uh, you know, where I live. Um, so working for some large financial organizations like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, um, doing again, security oriented stuff. And after a couple more years of that, um, I kind of thought to myself, you know, I could do this myself. And so I went to work as an uh, independent consultant and then started a company um, called True Shield in 2008. And uh, we originally were very focused on consulting to federal government. So did a lot of uh, work for like the FAA, the Department of Transportation, Treasury, uh, organizations like that. And um, eventually decided that it made sense to build a security operations center and offer that as a service. So we built a SOC um, again in Northern Virginia and did a lot of uh, you know, 24 seven threat detection and response work for federal government, for financial industry, et cetera. Uh, that company grew pretty rapidly and um, ultimately in 2018, so 10 years after I founded it, um, it was purchased by a private equity group called Sunstone Partners uh, based out of Silicon Valley. And um, they took my company and a couple of other companies and stuck them together to create Avertium where I am uh, CISO. So um, you know, I'm still here because I, you know, it's exciting what we do. I, I like stopping the bad guys and uh, the more that we can do the better. Um, but I, I don't know, you know, the recognition, like I, I said, I was surprised by it. I think, you know, reading um, kind of the, the response that I got from the organization that, that gave me that, I think it had a lot to do with the, the intensity with which we had to combat the scourge of ransomware over the year uh, between 20 and 21. Um, it was just so intense. There was, it was coming at us from every which direction. And, you know, for me, while, you know, I'm a Verdium CISO, I kind of feel like I'm the CISO of last resort for our customers, which means, you know, if somebody has a major crisis incident, uh, I'm, you know, I want to jump in and, and help solve that problem. And so I tend to be the kind of person that runs towards the fire uh, rather than away from it. And I think that that that's probably a lot of what, you know, had to do with it. But, you know, again, I was surprised and just eminently thankful for it. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, before I, I talk about your, your current career, I want to go back to something that you said earlier. Uh, and it's okay if you don't have anything on the spot, on the moment to, to share. But you said you did some things that you, you're you not like particularly proud of, like war driving. Yeah. Do you have any good war driving stories that come to your mind? Like, hey, well, we did this. This was pretty interesting. And or, this was pretty, pretty funny. Um, something that you did er early on. Like, hey, just, hey, we were full <laughs> we did this. Nothing terribly malicious. We we weren't really trying to break any any rules. We were just trying to see what we could do. Uh, didn't you know steal anything or anything like that. Mostly it was me and a buddy uh, driving around either one of our neighbor neighborhoods and getting onto uh, you know uh, networks and seeing if we could do stuff like open CD drives and send messages to the console and the person that was sitting at the console and. You know, fortunately, unfortunately, that was pretty easy to do at that time. And, um, you know, it was, it was just a curiosity more than anything else. Like I said, there was no malicious intent or activity involved in that. And uh, I've, at least none that I will avow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I understood. A, a, a lot of, even my, my fascination, you know, you start with, what can I make this do? Like, could could sure. this do something that's not really intended and in, um, I remember when I started coding, uh, when I first got 
the screen to do something. I was like, Hey, that's, that's awesome. Like, Hey, I, I want to, what else can I, what else can I make it do? But thinking about your, your career, uh, what comes to my mind as I hear your stories from the, from the federal government uh, up to what you're doing currently uh, surrounds a lot of, of, of risk. And so I'm interested in your thought process on risk. Uh, how do you assess whether it be personal or professional? What is your risk tolerance? How does this, how risk adverse or how risk tolerant is, you know, the, the CISO of the year or, yourself uh how how risk adverse how risk tolerant are you i i am very risk averse um for a variety of reasons and i think actually the the recognition for that only made me more risk averse because i have to think if i'm putting my bad guy hat on somebody sees that and says well i'm going to take a run at this guy and you know see if i can embarrass him and uh or you know worse not just embarrass him but get access to some interesting stuff because at the end of the day averting protects hundreds and hundreds of organizations 24 seven um, and a couple of thousand we perform you know other consulting oriented services for so you know for me any sort of risk that i present uh, to our customers is unacceptable and so i'm i'm particularly careful about my own security um, whether that be you know as i travel or as I interact with customers um, or even just you know what we do here at averdian right so we have to take it extremely seriously and you know, we try to be the gold standard as much as possible. So do all of the, you know, the zero trust stuff that I talk about a lot. Uh, we use our own um, internal SOC to monitor ourselves for you know threats and incident response. Um, we're again, we're we're blessed in that we've got a lot of expertise within the firm um, and not um, you know uh, reliant upon others uh, to help us you know solve some of these risks. So we have the ability to you know, formulate the right programs, you know, do the right assessments and things like that. We still do third party assessments and have people, you know, assess us just for audit purposes and things like that, because simply we're required to. But we know that at the end of the day, you know, we're not the compliance checkbox type company. We try to uh, make sure that we do security right and then compliance flows from that. And I think that speaks to the, the kind of the root of your question around risk tolerance. It's something that um, I think every organization and certainly anybody that's uh, responsible for you know, security or even just in leadership needs to be thinking about security risk and what their appetite is because, you know, companies are going to be different. Some companies can accept some risk. Maybe a, a fast moving startup can accept a little risk because they're trying to get, you know, ahead of the market and speed to market is the most important thing for them. Uh, but maybe a more conservative uh, company or maybe, you know, a company in a more conservative industry uh, just simply can't accept risk. And what that ultimately will yield is you know, what level of controls must be in place to drive risk down to whatever that acceptable level is. And then knowing that there's no way to completely remove risk altogether, there's always going to be some residual risk. What are we going to do about that, right? Do we ensure that, you know, how can we, you know, better protect ourselves against the, the potential outcome or exposure to those risks that there's just simply no way to, to completely remove from the situation. And then the other thing I think about as it relates to risk, so there, there's a couple of different types of risks, right? So you've got first party risks, those things that are in your control, right? So have I patched our systems or, you know, are we keeping up with vulnerability management, things like that? That's within our control. Um, but there's third party risk or supply chain risk or even fourth party or nth party risk that we have to be concerned about as well. And that's what scares me the most because it's a little bit outside of my control, but it, it not only could impact us, it could also impact our customers in sort of a cascading you know, risk. So our upstream technology provider has a problem, let's say log4j or something like that. We inherit that risk from them and then we pass it along down uh, the chain to our customers. And that's, that's what scares me. And I think that, that supply chain risk is one of those areas that's very tricky for our industry to solve. And I think personally, I think it's gonna be one of the biggest things that we've gotta be looking at and focused on in 2022 and beyond. I, I agree. because many, many people have learned third party risk, fourth party risk, and, and so on um, from Log4j or from like a solar winds attack. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you may not have been using variant vulnerable software and the third party that you did your due diligence on didn't as well, uh, didn't as well, but however, their partner may yeah. have. And we, uh, we see a lot of that and it could get really bad if it's like a cloud provider. If a cloud provider has that third, fourth party risk and you're hosted on this 
on this platform as well, a lot of companies could assume the same risk, which causes you to do like, hey, you want to do your due diligence on your third party. Um, you can ask who their fourth party are, who their third parties are, but how far down the train you want to go. I think there's a lot of risk that we don't talk about and particularly like inherent risk is one of my one of my i guess favorites if i was to put a term to it um mm -hmm. types of risk like what kind of risk does your organization have because you're in business mm -hmm. uh, and curious if organizations can answer that if they mm -hmm. can't it lets me know they're not as reflective as they should have been mm -hmm. like hey do you know where the keys to the kingdom are the keys to the castle are like what kind of a risk are you just assuming by being the type of organization are you are doing the type of business uh, that that you're doing? Yeah. My thoughts on that, if I can. So I guess yes, I I really believe that, and the way we look at it here is is adopting the art of war strategy. So the Sun Tzu book and the, really the the fundamental thesis of that being know yourself and know your enemy. Um, so knowing yourself is where that whole risk tolerance thing comes in and knowing which um, points of exposure are pr most probable for you, where you've got strengths, where you've got weaknesses, things like that. And with that knowledge, you can then understand, you know, what threats are likely to be um, impactful to you, uh, because certain threats are, you know, going to act or, and behave differently. And certain threat actors are going to behave differently depending upon their motivation. But the more you know about yourself and then, you know, you know, reflecting again uh, on what adversaries are likely to be you know, problems for you, you'll be in a better position to protect yourself and your organization. That's something we really, really believe in here. So we spend a lot of time and we even coach our customers around this um, using, you know, frameworks that are maybe a little, um, well, they're, they're certainly very traditional frameworks like the NIST cybersecurity frameworks, one we use quite a lot uh, because it gives us a nice heat map or maturity map um, on, you know, where again, strengths and weaknesses are. But then taking that and balancing it against uh, something like the MITRE ATT&CK framework, so we can see which TTPs are likely to be effective given you know the, either the, the relative weaknesses we have or customers have, um, you know, and therefore directing effort around showing those up. So that that's been effective for us, and it's something I would suggest everybody you know think about this problem as you know within that you know sort of perspective, like know yourself, know your enemy. With those two things together, you can definitely be in a better position if not. Yeah, love it. Love it. Um, many, many novice uh, are aspiring cybersecurity professionals or cybersecurity managers or, or directors. Um, you look at uh, one of one of my personal favorites, huge shout out to Verizon, like the Verizon data breach investigation report. If you get it and you think, all right, I'm gonna stop all this. Like, well, you, you should worry about where you're most vulnerable. Where's that? Where's the highest risk? So if you're a if you're a bank and you have no no like point of sale terminals or anything like how how concerned are you about point of sale type of attacks? Like that, there's certain things you need to worry about, and there's certain things that are less likely to happen within your organization, within the structure of your organization, that you may you may need to worry about. If you weren't worried about everything go back to pen and paper and throw on your tin foil hat. <laughs> yeah, the only, the only truly secure way to secure a system, you know, dig a hole, drop the computer in it, fill it with concrete and walk away. That's a secure <laughs> Oh, mo most definitely. Uh, so I, I wanna, I, I've looked at your, your work. I really, really impressed and, you know, follow great security professionals. I highly suggest anyone else listening uh, follow just great security professionals. It doesn't have to be Paul. Definitely doesn't have to doesn't have to be me. Um, just look at great individuals and, and follow their work and see what they say about certain things. Um, and one quote that you stated in a, in an article really really stuck out to me. Um, you were talking about being an analyst and kind of the thought process of an analyst in understanding how does someone look at a large amount of information and deduce that down? And you stated uh, the analyst investigative process is the linchpin, not the tool. And I thought that was very, very profound to the point where something I wrote down and I needed to, to reflect on that. I'm thinking about my team 
and that their their process and the process of their thought process mm -hmm. of the analytic side of like looking at logs is the linchpin and the tool is not 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 really the tool that they're using but their thought process through using that do you mind expounding upon that sure um you know i I think that very often our industry sort of fails in, in one regard and in, in a lot of people chase the shiny new tool, the shiny new object, or there's so much, um, if you go on the floor of RSA, there's thousands of companies that all have the next best tool, but they're missing the point in that at the end of the day, a human has to be able to use that tool to affect some outcome. And you know, when you're doing the job in a security operations center, you're consuming telemetry from a variety of different tools and you have to be able to contextualize that, synthesize all that telemetry and make a decision uh, based upon it. And the tools are not gonna give you the full answer. You have to still use your head and understand, again, the context, right? So what one alert within one environment means is gonna be different than what it might mean in another environment. And so certainly in an MSSP, that's a challenge that our analysts have to sort of wrap their heads around is, um, they really do need to understand that environment as a whole, because you know, think about like um, a, a firewall alert or an alert that comes out of a SIM. The SIM alert is not necessarily going to have information about what compensated controls might be around those you know, crown jewels, right? And you might get an alert that says these crown jewels are at risk, but if you know as an analyst that there's compensating controls around it, which will draw down the potential for that to actually be the point of exposure, then you're going to make a better decision as to whether or not it's a risk that requires an immediate response or not. And the inverse of that is also true. So if you see a lower level alert that comes out of a SIM, or even in your vulnerability management program, I see this quite a bit. Let's say you have a, a vulnerability that's maybe a CVSS 6, and it's a privilege escalation vulnerability. And because the way that your organization has wrongheadedly prioritized vulnerability management, you're not going to treat that as, as importantly as the CVSS 9, which might be buried deep in the environment. But I know from the fact that every ransomware case I've ever seen involves some sort of privilege escalation somewhere in the middle of the kill chain. So I know I really wanna make sure that that gets fixed to prevent the attack objective from actually being accomplished. It's, it's thinking like that, which will turn a um, you know, piece of commodity malware or vulnerability uh, into an incident. If you, if you miss the, you know, the, the stopping of the kill chain in the middle there, it, it, will, it will contribute to the eventual outcome of actually being an incident. You have to, a human has to do that, right? The tool can tell you this is CVSS 7 or this is a high severity alert, but if you can't interpret that within the context of the environment that you're looking at, then you're gonna miss the mark. And that really boils down to that analyst mindset of being able to look at you know, the full picture, the big picture, rather than each, um, each alert in a vacuum, right? You can't really do that. You have to be able to look at the, the context of them within the stream of, of telemetry that you're receiving. That's, that's sort of what I was getting at there. And, and that's also why um, when we focus on developing analysts, you, you have to you know, certainly train people how to use the tools, right? You have to tell them, you know, here's the buttons that you need to press in order to make the thing do what it needs to do. But it, that doesn't really train the analyst mindset. And so we spend a lot of time on that, right? So training someone actually how to interpret data, how to synthesize multiple different data streams and correlate them together, uh, how to interpret threat intelligence, um, all that stuff really makes a big difference in the quality of analysis. And that to me is, is what I was getting at with that comment is that that quality of analysis is bigger than just what the tool tells you. And that's, I think, never going to change. I'd, I'd be shocked if somebody developed, you know, the silver bullet tool and, you know, I don't, I just don't see it happening. If there was a sil silver bullet tool, right. we'd use it. We'd all be, <laughs> we'd all be using that. We'll just buy this one tool and we'll be, we'll be fine. So when you're, when you're training up your analysts, um, is there any particular, we know about the cliche Google interviews and like, Hey, how many blue marbles are in this jar or something along the lines of that? Not, not knocking it. Obviously Google's a fantastic organization, of course. just massive. Um, are there any personality traits for analysts that, that stick out to you? If someone's watching this and say, Hey, well, I want to be a better analyst. I, I love the comments. He said, I want to be a better, better analyst. Uh, are there any personality traits or keys to, to individuals that you're looking for uh, when you're hiring or you see someone in your current job role, like, hey, this person could possibly move into this role as, as an analyst. Um, yeah. Are there any things that stick out to you? Absolutely. I think probably the most important one is just passion, 
and, and being passionate about this industry. Um, there, I think there are a lot of people that step into a cybersecurity role uh, because they, you know, the jobs tend to be higher paying than even other technology uh, oriented jobs. And, you know, while that might be true, I, I think that kind of thinking um, is not really where the focus should be. Uh, if, if someone's passionate about a job, they're going to invest in, in develop themselves. They're going to look for ways to learn, to expand their knowledge, to develop their skill set, and they're going to sort of self-select themselves into kind of that lifelong learner mentality. And that to me is, is the most important thing for a couple of reasons. Um, so we all know the technology industry moves fast, but you know, my belief is that security, the subset of the security in, in the technology industry moves even faster than that. And so in order to keep up with bad actors and new techniques, or even new controls, depending if, if you want to be on the defensive or you know, understand the offensive side, um, you simply have to do the research. Nobody's going to deliver that to you. Nobody's going to put it on a silver platter and say, here's everything you need to know. You have to go out in search of that knowledge. And only the people that are you know, truly passionate about this industry are going to be the ones that do that. Maybe do it in their own time. Um, you know, maybe the job has the, the, the benefit of affording them some time for research. But to me, that's, that's really critical. The, the intellectual curiosity around uh, this industry is the, is the most important thing. So you, know, you mentioned it earlier. You, you like to see you know, if you can break something or if you can get it to do something that it, it, you know, it wouldn't normally do. And that's kind of the hacker mindset. Um, I love seeing that in, in team, even if they're very inexperienced or really junior, if they've got that sort of, you know, that intellectual curiosity to want to see how things are, are they break um, or, you know, how to fix them. That's really what I, I love to see, because that's somebody that can be shaped, uh, coached, uh, and who's going to want to shine, who's going to want to put in the effort. And uh, uh, that, that really makes a huge difference. Yeah, I. Um... I'm a sports fan. And so there was a, a coach that said, there's two type of athletes I don't like to coach. One, that will never do anything that I tell him or her to do. And then two, the one that will only do what I tell him, him or her to do. And I, I, I loved, I love that. So yeah, you're, you're right. You have to, you have to look at the data and it's, it's, it's definitely a human. I think security uh, my personal belief is very, very, it's a human problem. Mm -hmm. um, because if you look at the rate of innovation uh, from technology and you look at the rate of like data breaches and successful attacks and the amount of records lost, they marry each other. Most people with a, with a sane mind, you would think like, hey, these two correlate. What you're doing's not working. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that what we're doing is, is working because the technology inherently is, is improved. It's gotten, it's gotten better, but the commonality is we still have people inter interacting with this technology. And so the vulnerability mm -hmm. side is a lot on the human side, but the analytic side as well is, is definitely on the human side as well. So you have to be able to understand that data and look at the data and see like, Hey, I've never seen this before. Can I can I solve this? Can I follow these breadcrumbs? Is there is there any yeah. clues here? Yeah, that's the critical thinking, right? So, and I, I I I know where you're getting at with respect to sort of the the trend line of data breaches continuing to go up, while spend on cybersecurity continues to go up. So it seems like you know we're not having the effect that we ultimately would want. And I I think there's some truth to that, but I think really what is underlying that is you know, the, the intense focus on digital transformation, just the diaspora of data that, you know, there's data everywhere, all kinds of sensitive data everywhere. People just simply don't know where it is within their environment. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the biggest problems is that people just don't really understand uh, what data they have, uh, what value that data might have to an attacker, depending upon, you know, what motive that attacker has, whether it's financial or espionage or what have you, or just simply disruption. But you know, the more data that's out there, it seems logical, the more likelihood there is for data breaches to occur. And certainly, you know, I think everybody, every, you know, every major company that has any sort of technology enabled services understands that there's a huge amount of value that they can unlock in their data just to better understand their customers or their business partners or their competition. And so all that data is interesting to attackers as well. And if people aren't thinking that through and you know, understanding the, the means and outs, the puts and takes there, 
um, it's going to just continue in that trend. So, so I'd agree, but I, I do feel like we're making a difference. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I uh, don't want to come across as doom and gloom as like, Hey, there, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing we can do. Uh, so looking at uh, what you've provided and the, some of the work you've done, it's, it's clear that you're interested in the geopolitical side uh, of security and mm-hmm. looking at threat actors from uh, different different areas from whether it be Russian or, or Chinese yeah. or something along the lines of that. Uh, what, are, what are your takes on the current state of security from a global perspective? Uh, so I've spent a ton of time researching ransomware groups specifically and just trying to understand that underground economy of ransomware as a service. Um, we actually have a lot of really deep visibility into some of the ransomware organizations through some of the signals intelligence we're able to collect and a lot of the just open source intelligence that we gather from underground forums. So we know by and large, these guys operate out of uh, Eastern Europe, uh, former Soviet bloc countries, that's ransomware mostly. Uh, Many of them, very many of them are uh, based out of Russia. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, You know, first off, the majority of the this illicit activity um, is actually not illegal in Russia. Uh, Russia doesn't consider it to be illegal if the victim is not a Russian uh, um, citizen or company. So provided the ransomware group is attacking, you know, Western interests, be it Western Europe or the United States or North America, uh, they're generally going to just get a pass uh, by the, the Russian government, by the Russian intelligence services. And, you know, there, there's something to be said for that, right? So if we know that um, Russia is turning a blind eye to this activity, um, and, you know, we can even pinpoint some of the individuals, and, you know, DOJ certainly has, has indicted many Russian citizens for this sort of activity, but very, very rarely are they actually brought to justice because there's no extradition treaty. And like I said, this stuff isn't actually illegal uh, in Russia. To me, it's sort of a tacit um, underwriting of the activity by the Russian government. Basically, they know it's happening. Um, they're just not willing to do anything about it because it's in their interest geopolitically. Because the more damage they do, the way these Western interests, the the better it is for them economically. The ransom demand, once the victim pays it, is shared amongst that that group, right? It's shared amongst the the main ransomware group who developed the code. Their affiliates are the ones that are actually victimizing organizations. The other, you know, the access brokers, the cash out people, things like that, they share all these proceeds amongst these organizations, you know, this is conjecture, but it would not surprise me in the least if another uh, benefactor of that activity is the Russian government themselves. I, it just seems to make all the sense in the world if if the activity is, is again, they turn a blind eye to it, um, if they could also see some financial profit or financial incentive from doing it, you know, uh, I just wouldn't put it past them. Um, I don't think they're alone in that. I've seen recently, there's a new, uh, newer at least, um, underground forum called RAMP which is the ransomware anonymous marketplace um, that we've seen some Chinese actors um, interacting or collaborating with Russian actors. So ransomware is not exclusive to Russia. Um, it's certainly most prolific there. Um, but I think if you, know, if, you, if you think through you know, other nation states that have in, uh, pretty good cyber capabilities or very advanced cyber capabilities, you've got North Korea, um, you've got Iran, um, there, there are others as well. There are even uh, very specific or niche areas of the world that you might not expect there to be some activity like this, but Argentina, as an example, um, is known to have one of the most prolific zero-day marketplaces in the world, where you know developers are actively looking for zero-day exploits and then selling them to the highest bidder, be that a nation-state actor, maybe a terrorist organization, or you know anybody that is willing to pay. Um, and so you've got these pockets of capabilities around the world, and they tend to follow a, you know, a couple of patterns in my mind. You've got uh, either a, a, a government organization that's willing to either look the other way or seize this activity as beneficial to their global strategy, or you might see some socioeconomic uh, depression where individuals who might be very talented, very sophisticated, good developers, uh, curious about what it is that we do, aren't able to earn the same amount of money um, by putting their work, you know, their, their knowledge to good. Uh, as they can by, you know, doing the bad things. So instead they, you know, use their, their expertise, you know, for ill. And um, the, I think that's not going to go anywhere, uh, especially uh, out of Russia, because, you know, we saw recently, uh, I think Revil uh, got taken down by the Russian government. And that's a very, very rare circumstance. But personally, you know, again, I, the critical thinker in me says that I don't really believe what I'm seeing there. 
because I personally believe given what's happening right now, you know, in the actual away from keyboard politics between Ukraine and Russia, that um, the appearance of uh, playing along or being a good uh, international diplomatic or diplomatic citizen uh, is, is in their interest at the moment. And so they, were, they, they took down this, the, these members of this organization. But you know, as we've seen happen before, when one of these ransomware groups uh, is taken down, another pops up right behind it. And more often than not, it's really just a rebranding exercise. So I think even if these were the core revolt actors, um, you know, some other group's going to take their place. We saw it happen with Darkseid that turned into Black Matter. We saw it happen with um, Netwalker after they got taken down. So another group's just going to pop up right behind them. And I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see other countries in the world uh, that are maybe a little bit grayer area in terms of, you know, I'll say this, you know, government ethics as an example. Uh, you, you, you know, take Venezuela or some of the other sanctioned countries. Um, if they can see, you know, financial benefit to you know, their, their government by performing some of these, you know, illicit actions, it just wouldn't shock me if it happened. And, um, you know, I, I would say that's probably going to be development we'll see at some point, whether that's this year or not, I don't know, but uh, certainly we'll see the activity continue out of Russia. Oh, wow. Well, does it seem like this is just boiling over in, in your opinion? Like, hey, this is going to get, this is going to get worse uh, before we get better. Or do you think ever the teams have been formed, the skill sets have been have been made, and so this is kind of the the world we're going to live in, or is this evolving? This geopolitical world evolving as fast as the technology is evolving, and so what we see today is most likely not what we're going to see five years from now, or even maybe even five months from now. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're quite at the peak yet. Um, I think that it's going to continue to ramp up because it's just so profitable and not even just ransomware. There's other, you know, other types of, of cyber attacks that will continue to, to proliferate. Um, but when you see, you know, one of these ransomware groups making $100 million, you know, anybody that, you know, is morally bankrupt that looks at that and says, I could do that, uh, they're going to take a crack at it, I, I have to think. And so, you know, the, the, the more of that that happens, it's just going to be sort of a compounding effect. And until and unless, um, you know, we as good guys can convince the world to protect themselves better, um, I just don't see it going away. And what's, I think, most shocking about that, if you look at um, sort of the typical kill chain for, you know, a very crippling ransom attack, uh, it's not like they're, you know, exploiting some zero day that they developed. They're not burning zero days for ransomware attacks. There's only a couple of examples of that. Kaseya is one of them. Um, but very, very rare that that happens. More often than not, it's either commodity, you know, basic vulnerabilities, basic hygiene that people just don't do. They don't patch their, you know, their firewalls. They don't patch their VPN concentrators. They leave vulnerable uh, Microsoft remote desktop protocol exposed to the internet, or they just have bad sloppy passwords. And that's how it happens. So those are the basics. So, you know, if we can just get the world to understand cyber security 101, the basic hygiene, then you know the, the problem will 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 start to turn the tide, but un, until that happens, I just don't see it slowing down. Oh wow, yeah, I I, I agree. When I was uh, teaching, I was in so part of my career I was started in cyber. Then I decided to to teach for a while, uh, which I wholeheartedly enjoy. Um, I would tell my students that cyber is a unique industry where the classroom is harder than the real world. Because in the classroom, we're going to make you have uh, difficult passwords. We're going to make you shut down these, these well-known protocols and these well-known ports that, that aren't currently being used. However, when you go out into the industry, the password to that server is probably admin. <laughs> and the username is, is gonna, probably, I, probably admin. I'm going to break out in hives here because I've seen <laughs> really, really crippling ransomware attacks against hospitals where, you know, when we looked at what happened, we could see in the logs, like, you know, LSAS gets dumped and exfiltrated. And then, you know, it's clear what would happen then is bad guys are trying to crack password hashes in their own environment. And so we said, all right, well, let's see what we can do. Let's try the same thing, see if we can crack these, these passwords. And within a couple of hours, we had like 300 of the 900 passwords. Password 01 was the most common password. The name of the company one was the next most common password. And then it was like summer 2020 was the most common one after that. That's like, come on guys. 
This is so basic, right? And these were not just low level uh, user accounts. These were administrators, domain administrator accounts. And it's like, you know, I, unfortunately, the, you can't fix that without a real uh, concerted focus on security awareness training. And unfortunately, people, you know, I, I, I'm sure you get this, but, you know, security awareness training for the vast majority of the world is you get a 15 minute video, you click next, 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 and you're done for the year. And that's it. And that's obviously ineffective, right? So to your point earlier, the problem is a human problem. And until we can solve that, it's like I said, that it's not going to get any better. Yes, you're right. And for everyone, let it be known. Password two is not <laughs> twice as secure as password one. <laughs> so to, to, to close this out, to be to be in the my club, my club is minorities in cyber. Uh, I just want to get uh, a couple of seconds of of your time to, to talk about what are you doing? Is there anything that you're doing? Um, any words of encouragement or some ideas for minorities, um, some women, uh, whether different ethnicities, diversity and thought uh, to get into to, to get into cybersecurity, to work for uh, someone like yourself at Averdium? Um, what what are what are you doing to help diversify um, cybersecurity? Well, I think first off, um, I think what you're touching on is one of the core problems in the resource shortfall that this industry has. We, we know we've got millions of open jobs and not enough people to fill them. And un unfortunately, in my opinion, at least, that's because the, the, the common demographic of the cybersecurity worker looks like me. And until that changes, you know, I think we're going to continue to have that resource shortfall. So this is something the industry really needs to invest in. Uh, you know, for us, we do work with uh, some charitable organizations, you know, women in cybersecurity is a good one. Um, there are others that are out there like that. Um, but I, you know, I would just, you know, strongly encourage anybody that's interested that happens to be, you know, a, a minority or, you know, a woman or anything like that that's got interest in this, uh, you know, reach out to the, you know, local organizations that might ha happen to be in your region, because, you know, chances are really good they're going to, you know, think like I do and think like we do and want to put you know, those interested and curious people in positions that they can succeed in. And I think one of the problems that um, contributes to this whole thing is just accessibility. And that's something also that we've got to solve. Um, and what I mean by that is it, it can be challenging for, you know, somebody that might be socioeconomically disadvantaged to build a home lab or to go and take the trainings or to get the books and things like that. There are uh, quite a number of free resources that are uh, available uh, for that sort of thing. Um, you, uh, MIT and Harvard actually have freely available coursework that anybody in the world can go and take that supports this sort of interest. And so if you've got, you know, that, that sort of curiosity, I'd be looking for those free resources just to get started. And then, you know, another thing is, um, you know, look for a mentor. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm happy to do that sort of thing with people that I work with, and I'm, there, I'm not alone in that. Uh, and that's, I think, one thing that others that are, that have had success, that have found, you know, leadership positions in this industry, it's incumbent upon us to take that mentorship mindset so that we can you know, create that next generation that's gonna be able to step into the role and you know, preferably you know, regardless of, of what you know, race or creed or whatever that individual happens to be. Because I, like I said, I truly believe that, that is the source of our resource problem. And if we can solve that, then we're gonna start making a difference uh, you know, at a global scale. I, I love it, I love it. And I, I agree wholeheartedly that um, we need we need help because this is this is an industry where we can't let the talent pool just fall off and we can't have down decades or down even a year because the problem is is so is so vast. Um, I asked a, a group of professionals at a government facility, like, do you feel like we're winning the war on cybersecurity? Just raise your hand. Um, not a single person raised their hand. And if we're losing now, if we don't get enough people into where we can start turning this tide, we I don't want to know what real what losing really really looks like, because uh, right. at some point in time, uh, you and I we we're gonna want to hang it up, right? We need to be able to <laughs> we need to be able to call it call it call it quits at some point in time. So we need those after us to be ready to ready to take the mantle and run. 
Yeah, agreed. And it's it's really our responsibility to ensure that that happens. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Paul, for joining me on the Mic Club. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your expertise. Uh, I'll continue to follow you. I'll throw down your LinkedIn profile down in the description. So anyone, if you want to connect with Paul, I highly suggest you all connect with Paul right now and follow his work. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you all for watching. Thank you. Peace.